Indeed, God is God alone, and we want to celebrate that today, and welcome to all of you who have come to our worship today, and especially uh, we're looking forward to the cadet presentation, and, and they're leading us in worship today, and uh, God is good, and the, the sunshine testifies to His glory and to His goodness, and may we enjoy that today. I invite you to stand for our call to worship. Today we consider that great theme of God is in control, and God is the God of the nations, and the Bible speaks of that throughout, and we're going to look at that in a particular way uh, from the book of Daniel. But for our call to worship, we read these words from Isaiah 40. Do you not know do you not hear? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell him, who brings princes to nothing and makes rulers of the earth as emptiness. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not be faint. That is our God and the promises that he gives us. Let us unite our hearts and call upon <clears throat> his name in a moment of silent prayer. People of God, from where does our help come? <clears throat> Grace, mercy, and peace be given to you from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The Lord is King, enthroned in might. Let's sing the three stanzas.
The song that we sang recalls that great event when God gave his law to his people. God claimed his people as his own. He saves them by his grace, and then he calls them to follow him. He claims them. He puts them under his control and wants them to submit to that control. And we read of that also in uh, the first epistle of John, chapter 2, where John says, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins. That's kind of a big word, isn't it? Propitiation. Can you guys say it? Propitiation. That means Jesus paid for our sins by his death on the cross. And not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. And by this we know that we have come to know him, if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says that he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. It's a tall order to walk in the way that Jesus himself walked. Let's come to him with confession. Heavenly Father, we have heard again your will. Your will is that we do not sin. We know that so well. We, we hear it all the time. And yet, oh God, we must confess that sin comes so easily to us. And we uh, repent of that. We feel badly about that. And uh, we want to do better. And we ask that you will forgive us. We ask that we may know that forgiving love of Jesus, the cleansing of his blood, and the renewal of his Holy Spirit. And we pray that there, we might thereby show that we belong to you, O God, and that, uh, and that we are a people who are delivered and are part of a new kingdom under the control of the Spirit of God. Hear us in Jesus, we pray. Amen. The cadets are, we're going to sing their song at this time, their theme song, Living for Jesus. It's been a theme song a long time. The cadets have, was organized, I believe, in 1952. It's a long time. I remember, I guess that dates me. I remember when cadets came to be. And I remember uh, being a cadet sitting in the pews here and wearing a uniform. Oh, that was great. And um, learn this song, beautiful song, Living for Jesus, a song that still speaks with such life and vibrancy. So we're going to stand. Um, let's stand to sing that, and while we sing that, the cadets are going to come forward and then lead us in a presentation. <clears throat>
morning. Uh, welcome to Cadet Sunday. Would you please join us in our Cadet Litany? Sorry, this year's Cadet theme is God's in control. God's in control of our daily provisions. God's in control of our present, our future. God's in control in powerful ways of every cadet club around the world. God's in control of relationships being built between counselors and cadets as they together learn what it means to be living for Jesus. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod, your staff, com they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. In all areas of lives, in the good times, in our struggles with each day, we can boldly say, When we feel weak and that we can't go on, when we feel afraid and don't want to take the next step, when I am discouraged and I wonder what God has plans for me, I need to refocus on God's promises and remember. So again this year, we're taking our Bible lessons from the Cadet Quest magazine. It's not just Bible lessons, but stories, puzzles, knowledge quizzes, challenges, and crafts. This is a great tool that we have because you support the cadet program. Speaking of support for our club, we can always use more counselors, so please see me if you have any questions. We're also looking for men that would like to share a hobby or a craft or a skill with a group of energetic boys. A quick note about the upcoming Pinewood Derby. I was reading that it's a 6.45 start. Uh, that might have been a little confusing. If you're having a car there, um, if the weigh-in actually starts at 6.30, so you need to get signed in and your car weighed so we can uh, make up the brackets. Uh, this year we have three counselors and 14 boys. Um, uh, thank you, parents. <laughs> If any of you know a boy, fourth to the eighth grade, we do have our club's contact information in the form of a postcard that you can give to parents. This, as most cadet seasons, has been very busy. We started our visit, we started our season with a visit to the spot. There's never a bad time for ice cream. Our church hosted the Heritage Council fall kickoff. The Heritage Council is made up of about 12 churches. Our entertainment was Reptiles by, by LS, it was very well attended. We built, repaired, and launched rockets. Thank you, Chad, for finding us the space we needed. We returned to the cadet building with the same number of rockets we left with, which is somewhat unusual. Bird feeders, suet holders, and model cars were built. We have an ongoing project to build a go-kart. This is going to take some time, but it's working with hand tools and learning about small engine small engines and just how dirty, dirty can be. Um, we had pumpkin carving, uh, Christmas bingo, sledding, and a gym night which included floor hockey and basketball. They never seemed to tire. We all watched, with some, ama we all watched some amazing puck handling from counselor Chris, and I guess that's the thing they do where he comes from. A few basic camping skills were learned by some of our youngest group, compass reading, safe handling of an ax and hatchet, if there is such a thing for an eight-year-old boy. These boys were preparing for the snow derby, which sadly was canceled this year. With only a few meetings left, we still need to build some fires and learn more about camp cooking. This year, it's breakfast for dinner. An upcoming event this summer is the All Michigan Campery, which will be held on July 20th to the 23rd near Allegan. It's always held the year before the International Campery. Um, about the International Campery, the only official information they've released 
is that it's called Camp Hickory, and it'll be July 19th to the 26th in 2023. And lastly, muzzleloaders were built by the senior class. This always teaches patience because it's such a long process. These muzzleloaders had a special touch added by Grant from AIM North Engraving. Each one was etched with the cadet logo, the church name, the cadet's name, and the year. So if you have any questions about that, you can ask Chad. So thank you again for your support of this important ministry, and we're done. Thank you, Rob, and thank you to the other counselors as, as well. We so appreciate um, your investment into these uh, young boys. It's, um, I think, if, if ever a, a, a cadet program is necessary, it is today in our present society for, um, for, for there to be men who model what it is to, to, um, to be Christian men in, in our present society, and, and thank you, counselors, for doing that and for your investment of time and, and your skills as well. It sounds like you have a wonderful program, and um, I hope you also have a good time at your camperies and, and whatever else you do and some of the things that you are making. It's, it's great. Thank you very, very much. We go to God in prayer at this time. Um, First of all, we want to extend our sympathy to Chuck and Marsha Rhoda in the death of Chuck's brother Jeff, who died yesterday of a heart attack at the age of only 60 years old. So our hearts go out to Chuck and Marsha uh, and their family at, at this time as they grieve the loss of, of this dear family member. And you may want to, uh, we'll try to keep you posted also as to visitation times and times of, of funeral. Uh, on a more, a better note, uh, we're glad to report that little Emily Gruppen, the granddaughter of Bill and Jan, was able to be discharged from the hospital yesterday. And she is doing much better after being in intensive care for a bit. And uh, we're, we're grateful for for God's healing grace, and uh, we give thanks to him. Let's come to him in prayer. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for your kindness and grace. Thank you that you are a God who is always faithful to your covenant promises. And uh, thank you, Lord, that you do care for us, uh, that we are indeed under your control. And, uh, and that is why we have a, a comfort both in life and in death. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us together this morning. We praise you for this beautiful day. And uh, thank you for this wonderful opportunity of worship. And we pray, Lord, that you will enable us by your spirit to keep our, our attention singled on you. And we pray that, our, that our, our affections might be warmed as we, we think of what you have done for us and who you are and that you are among us even in this hour of worship. We thank you for your blessing over the past week. Lord, truly, you have provided for us. Thank you for your protection. Thank you for the measure of health that we could enjoy. Thank you for the activities in which, in which we could be involved. <clears throat> and we're grateful, Lord, that you have so, so, so generously uh, provided for us. Father, we pray for your, for your comforting grace to, um, to Chuck and, and Marsha at this time as they grieve the loss of a dear brother. Uh, Father, we, we, we uh, are often awed by your <clears throat> providence, by your ways with us, your plans for us. We'll never understand them. Help us to uh, submit ourselves to them and, and realize in faith that when we belong to Jesus Christ, we belong to him forever. 
in life and in death. Father, we thank you for the gift of healing and restoration. We're so grateful that little Emily was, be, was able to come home yesterday from the hospital. And um, we, we pray, Father, that she may continue to show good progress and full restoration once again. And uh, Father, we pray for others who, who may grieve. Uh, we uh, pray, Lord, that uh, you will grant your, your, uh, your comforting grace to, to them. Sometimes those wounds of grief, of grief run deeply in our souls. <clears throat> and we pray for, for that day-by-day -day, uh, comfort that your word gives us. We, we pray for those who may be lonely, those who may be dealing with other difficult issues in their lives. And, and Father, we pray that you will help grant them renewed strength and uh, renewed courage from day to day. Thank you, Father, that uh, you are always faithful. Thank you for the, our marriages, our families. We're grateful for the anniversaries that Rob and Robin uh, Overway and Harris and Jane Overway may, may celebrate this week. <clears throat> and we thank you for them and we thank you for their families and we pray that you will bless them together. Father, we pray for all of our children and our young people. Thank you for the talents and gifts that you've given to them and their wonderful skills. And we are grateful, Lord, for, a cadet, for an organization like the Cadets <clears throat> to, uh, to uh, train these young boys in the, in the way of Christ uh, with all that that involves. And uh, we are grateful for this season. We're grateful for our counselors and junior counselors, and we ask, Lord, that you will um, assist them <clears throat> and give them uh, the ability to, to provide good leadership and to mentor the, the very life of Christ. We pray, Lord, for our young people, for our college students, and we ask that you will help them as well, and uh, we pray that you will keep them safe, and we pray them, above all, that you will uh, keep them safe from the evil one <clears throat> who constantly goes about uh, uh, trying to devour uh, someone with, with his uh, uh, f false ideologies and, and uh, false sense of, of, uh, of, of happiness. And so, Father, we pray that you will grace our young people with, uh, with much wisdom. Father, we, <clears throat> we pray for those in military service, and we ask, Lord, that you will keep them also and, and help them to, to live the life of, of Christ and, and wherever they are. We pray for our congregation and the ministry of our congregation. We pray, Father, that you will help us to cherish your word. And uh, thank you for Pastor Tripstra and his ministry among us. We pray that you will give him daily strength and encouragement and insight in, in how to lead and, and shepherd us and grant this grace to our, our elders and deacons as well. We pray for our country, O oh God. Our country is in, is in danger, and as many other countries are in the world at, at this time. And uh, we pray, Father, that you will use these circumstances to, to help us see that you indeed are God and you are in control and we must submit ourselves to you. And so, Father, we pray that our, our leaders may also have that, that wisdom to abide by the word that you have given to us. And so, Father, we pray that, that, um, that you will spare this world of, of war and uh, as the war seems to be threatening in, in, in the Ukraine, and uh, we pray, Father, that you will subdue those, those powers that, that seek to wreak such havoc in our world today. And Lord, we pray that you will now hear us, hear us in the name of Jesus, amen. <clears throat> we turn in song with grateful heart by thanks I bring, number 585, and lift up your heart's hymnals, and let's sing the four stanzas. <clears throat>
We turn in the scriptures at this time to the book of Daniel, the Old Testament book of Daniel. A story where there is so much action and drama, supernatural drama, as we are going to note. Daniel chapter 5. Certainly a chapter that underscores the control of God. <clears throat> King Belshazzar. King Belshazzar was a king of a kingdom called Babylon or Chaldea. And um, it was a, a very menacing kingdom. It, it brought the Israelites or the people of Judah into captivity at one time. And maybe you remember the story of Daniel and so forth. And Daniel's going to figure very prominently in this story as well. Belshazzar followed uh, Nebuchadnezzar, um, and uh, this is what is said. King Belshazzar made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in front of the thousand. Belshazzar, when he tasted the wine, commanded that the vessels of gold and of silver that Nebuchadnezzar his father had taken out of the temple in Jerusalem be brought that the king and his lords, his wives and his concubines, might drink from them. And then he brought in the golden vessels that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God in Jerusalem, and the king and his lords and his wives and his concubines drank from them. <clears throat> they drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze, wood, uh, iron, wood, and stone. Immediately, the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace, opposite the lampstand. And the king saw the hand as it wrote. <clears throat> then the king's color changed, and his thoughts alarmed him. His limbs gave way, and his knees knocked together. The king called loudly to bring in the enchanters, the Chaldeans, and the astrologers. The king declared to the wise men of Babylon, whoever reads this writing and shows me its interpretation shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around his neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. And then all the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the writing or make known to the king the interpretation. Then King Belshazzar was greatly alarmed, and his color changed, and his lords were perplexed. The queen, because of the words of the king and his lords, came into the banquet hall, and the queen declared, <clears throat> O king, live forever. Let your thoughts alarm you, and your color change. There is a man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. In the days of your father, light and understanding and wisdom like the wisdom of the gods were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, made him chief of the magicians, enchanters, Chaldeans, and astrologers. Because an excellent spirit, knowledge, and understanding to interpret dreams, explain riddles, and solve problems were found in this Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar. Now let Daniel be called, and he will show the interpretation. Then Daniel was brought in before the king. The king answered and said to Daniel, You are that Daniel, one of the exiles of Judah, whom the king my father brought from Judah. I have heard of you that... The spirit of the gods is in you, and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom are found in you. Now the wise men, the enchanters, have been brought in before me to read this writing and make known to me the, its inter interpretation, but they could not show the interpretation of the matter. But I have heard that you can give interpretations and solve problems. But if you can read the writing and make known to me its interpretation, you shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around your neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, Let your gifts be for yourself and give your rewards to another. 
Nevertheless, I will read the writing to the king and make known to him the interpretation. O king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar your father kingship and greatness and glory and majesty. And because of the greatness that he gave him, all peoples, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him. When he, <clears throat> whom he would, he killed, and whom he would, he kept alive. Whom he would, he raised up, and whom he would, he humbled. But when the king was lifted up and his spirit was hardened so that, the de so that he dealt proudly, he was brought down from his kingly throne, and his glory was taken from him. He was driven from among the children of mankind, and his mind was made like that of a beast, and his dwelling was with the wild donkeys. He was fed grass like an ox, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven until he knew that the Most High God rules the kingdom of mankind and sets over it whom he will. And you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your, your heart Though you knew all this, but you have lifted up yourself against the Lord of heaven, and the vessels of his house have been brought in before you, and you and your lords and your wives and your concubines have drunk wine from them, and you have praised the gods of silver and of gold and of bronze, wood, iron, wood, and stone, which do not see or hear or know, but the God in whose hand is your breath and whose you are, all your way, and, who, and whose are all your ways you have not honored. Then from his presence the hand was sent, and this writing was inscribed, and this was the writing that was inscribed, Mena, Mena, Tekel, and Parson. This is the interpretation of the matter. Mena, God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. Tackle, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. And then Belshazzar gave the command and Daniel was clothed with purple. A chain of gold was put around his neck and a proclamation was made about him that he should be third <clears throat> ruler in the kingdom. And that very night, Belshazzar, the Chaldean king, was killed. And Darius <clears throat> the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. The word of the Lord. Dear friends in Christ, <clears throat> on the morning of September 11, 2001, <clears throat> President George W. Bush was sitting in front of a group of second graders in a school in Sarasota, Florida. It was a happy and <clears throat> peaceful time as the president engaged in this cordial conversation with <clears throat> these children. But then his chief of staff, Andrew Card, entered the room and whispered in his ear, informing him that two passenger planes crashed into the Twin Towers in New York City. It was to say, shocking news. And it changed the lives of millions of people. It changed the very history of our country. It was most likely the most shocking news President Bush had ever heard or had to process. Imagine the shock felt by King Belshazzar sitting there in that banquet hall at this raucous feast when out of nowhere the fingers of a man's hand appeared on the wall. Imagine as you're sitting where you are and you would see on the wall a hand with these fingers writing something. A mysterious message. Just a short memo, we could call it. Mena, Mena, Tekel, and Perez. The loud noises in that banquet hall suddenly came to a halt. 
The party goers gasp in fright. The king's terror registered on his whole body. Verse 6 says that then the king's color changed and his thoughts alarmed him. His limbs gave way and his knees knocked together. He was practically paralyzed by his fear. Now, obviously, that was a supernatural occurrence. Hands don't just appear and write memos to people on a wall. This was clearly an act of God. But we must understand that God is never so mean-spirited and so malicious as to randomly scare people out of their wits. God's not like that. There was a good reason for scaring King Belshazzar. Belshazzar was a thoroughly wicked man. And we have to bear in mind that wicked people think that they are in control. They are accountable to no one. Therefore, they can do whatever they want to do without considering what God thinks of their behavior. Belshazzar was a man who liked to indulge his, 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 his desires and his, 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 uh, his evil lusts in a big way. So he throws this huge banquet for a thousand of his nobles. And the booze flowed freely. And each of the first four verses mentioned is made of the drinking of wine. And we know that such kinds of situations create that climate for much careless behavior, much foolish behavior. Allow drinking to get out of hand and the potential for bad has no limits. Things always go from bad to worse. And there are a few factors which made Belshazzar's conduct especially offensive. The first is that he made himself the center of attention. Most likely, he and, and the most important men in his court sat on an elevated platform in that banquet hall. And that seems to be implied in verse 1, which says in the original that he drank wine in front of the thousand. And that conveys the idea that he drank in order to be watched by those thousand nobles. It was an, a, an obnoxious expression of his pride. Maybe this was his way of saying, well, look at me. Look at me, the big, the big hot shot, the big macho man. Truth be told, he made, it made him look quite reprehensible, did it not? Second factor which made his behavior so offensive is his act of blasphemy. What's blasphemy? What is blasphemy? We don't hear that word anymore. We should, because there's a lot of it out there. Blasphemy. Blasphemy is showing disrespect and showing dishonor to God and the things of God. These people, you see, didn't party just for the sake of having a good time. They did this to honor the gods of Babylon and to dishonor the God of Israel. And as they consumed their wine, the song of praise went up to their pagan gods. And as the party was going on and degenerating by all their drunkenness, Belshazzar came up with the idea of using the holy vessels taken from the temple of God in Jerusalem. And to appreciate what was going on here, we have to remember some of their recent history and that of the nation of Judah. Nebuchadnezzar, who was the ancestor of Belshazzar, conquered Judah. Remember that story? He took many of the people into captivity in Babylon, and he, he completely demolished the city of Jerusalem, demolished their, their, their beloved temple that was built by Solomon. And that happened, too, under the, under the control of God because Judah was so terribly unfaithful to God. You see, and those, those people believed that every nation had its own god or gods. And if one nation conquered another nation, it meant that the god of the conquered nation 
the one that got beat, was inferior to the God of the conquering nation. And since Babylon defeated Judah, Judah's God must be a nothing God, and inf- certainly an inferior God. So at this banquet, Belshazzar thought, wouldn't it be fun to taunt the God of those people from Judah? And so bring out the gold and the silver and the goblets from the, from the uh, J- Jerusalem temple, which were all kept in storage by Nebuchadnezzar, and let them use those, those vessels and drink from them. And we'll show those Jews what a wimpy God they really have. And in doing so, Belshazzar wished to thumb his nose at the God of Israel. Of course, he should have known better. He should have known about Daniel and Daniel's three friends who were once thrown into the fiery furnace because of of their faith in God and who miraculously emerged from that furnace unscathed. There There wasn't even a smell of smoke on their clothes. And so the God of the Jews was indeed to be a God to be feared. And yet Belshazzar had the brazen audacity to call for the temple vessels to be brought in to scorn the God of the Jewish people. We might compare this to a group group of, of thugs, hoodlums, stealing a communion set from a church and using it for a booze party. You see, it's one thing to ignore God, but it's far worse to deliberately mock Him. And that is like poking a finger in His eye. And sometimes that happens in our day, doesn't it? When people will use the Bible, the sacred scriptures, for their silly jokes. Some comedians and comedians do that in our day. And may I say to the young boys and everyone else here, Never laugh at a joke where the name of God is mentioned or when when anything from the Bible is mentioned that dishonors the name of God. God takes special note of that. God will defend his honor. He confronted the king for his outrageous blasphemy. And it's a wonder that Belshazzar and those thousand men did not choke on their wine and fall over dead. They were all doomed, but before the axe fell, God has a word to say to them. God will be vindicated and show that his acts of judgment are fully justified and that he is righteous in his dealings with people. That that is how it should be also, that is how it will be also on the last day. Before All the enemies of Christ go away to everlasting punishment in hell. They will be shown the reason for their condemnation. There will be reason for their condemnation. And they will hear from the Lord himself that his just judgments are just. God will not not treat anyone unjustly. Everybody will get what they deserve. Most striking was the way that God revealed himself to Belshazzar. God didn't lay bare his holy arm by shaking the earth and making that banquet hall crumble around them. No, he used just a few fingers, a few fingers to appear on a wall. Amazing, isn't it? Immediately, the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace opposite the lampstand, says verse 5. Sounds kind of spooky, doesn't it? Here was surely a case of shock and awe. The king and the rest were so awestruck at that mysterious hand that that, that appeared in, in the light of those flickering candles. And the king did not dismiss this episode as just being a practical joke of some magician. Why not? Likely his conscience was striking him. Inwardly he feared the worst. 
And fear has a way of registering itself on the human body. The blood drained from his face. It turned as white as sheet as a sheet. It's mentioned twice in this passage that the color of his, of his face was drained. And his legs went limp. Verse 9 says, Then Belshazzar was greatly alarmed, and his color changed, and his lords were perplexed. He truly was a case of stark terror. Think of the fear of people when the Lord Jesus shall descend from heaven in great power and glory. When that trumpet is going to sound and the whole world is going to light up with the glory of God and this world is going to be consumed in this divine fire. Revelation 6 says, Then the kings of the earth and the great ones and the generals and the rich and the powerful and everyone, slave and free, hid themselves in the caves and, the, and among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? That's what people are going to say when Jesus comes. Belshazzar's fear here, you say, was really just a foreshadowing. This, this gives us just a glimpse of the fear that, that those who, <clears throat> who stand before the mighty judge will feel one day when they have to give an account of their lives. And their sins are not forgiven. And they know that they must face judgment. They will be in fear of what is going to come from the lips of Christ when he's going to say, depart from me, go away into everlasting destruction. In his fear, Belshazzar wanted to know what that mysterious memo meant. He feels so guilty to believe, to believe that that word held any good for him he fears the worst, it seems, so he called for those who were supposed to be experts in, in those cultic practices and magical arts, but they were of no help, and this brought more confusion and more fear into the picture. Finally, interestingly, the queen, the queen mother enters the scene. And how does she address this chaotic situation where men are shivering with fear and many of them are drunk and are very confused? And she's very clear-headed and very thoughtful, very composed. Very interestingly, she now brings up the man Daniel. And she remembered the days when Daniel, that man of God, lived in the royal palace. And, and here she becomes the voice of history. How important it is, especially in confusing times, to listen to the voice of history, which so many like to ignore. The 19th century philosopher G.W. Hegel once said that the only thing we learn from history is that we have learned nothing from history. It's a cynical comment, but it does describe the truth about Belshazzar and those who are like him yet today. They learn nothing from history. That's the big lesson that the queen mother has for this wicked king. You learn nothing from history, she was saying between the lines. There is someone from the past who figured so prominently into the history of Babylon. He taught your ancestor Nebuchadnezzar some very important lessons, and he is able to interpret dreams and riddles and solve difficult problems. And his name is Daniel. And so now call for Daniel, and you will hear an even more eloquent voice of history. Perhaps the queen mother tried to warn Belshazzar before, but it was, not, it was not until the handwriting was on the wall and his knees were knocking in fright that he was willing now to finally listen to her advice. Often when life, you see, starts to crumble, are we then willing to listen to the warnings of history? It's fascinating to see what Daniel did. Daniel by now was getting on in years, 
And he had been sidelined by this time. I think he had some gray hairs and showing signs of age. And now he comes into the forefront again. And the king said all kinds of nice things about him, and he is very deferential toward him and offers him gifts if you could read the writing. Daniel stood before him, very composed and very calm and collected, and with all the authority that his character had won for him. This is a beautiful to see. What a contrast he was to that wicked king. The queen spoke of him as one who had the spirit of the holy gods in him. That's was her understanding. She didn't understand anything about the spirit of the true God. Daniel, Daniel did have by this time a stellar reputation. And in that regard, he stood 10 feet tall in that fearful crowd. He was a righteous man and a very capable. And in this way, too, he revealed the Christ. Daniel dismissed those offers of reward from the king. He will give the king <clears throat> the interpretation of those mysterious writings without any pay. Daniel wants to be free to speak as God reveals his word to him. So standing erect and calm before this nervous audience, he speaks. Quite a sight to behold. And everyone was listening. But before Daniel got to interpret the handwriting on the wall, there's something the king must hear first. The king's main problem is not his inability to read the writing. It is his wicked heart. And that is what Daniel will address first. And he has two main, main points in his sermon for the king. The first is reminding the king of how God dealt with Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, he was the one uh, to whom God gave a kingdom, a kingdom of great might and power and glory. In other words, he reminds Belshazzar that, yes, God is in control, and he showed himself, he, he showed his control to Nebuchadnezzar. And then he mentions the pride of Nebuchadnezzar and the way that God chased him from his throne by making him live like an animal. Nebuchadnezzar felt God's foot on his neck until he acknowledged the sovereignty and the majesty of God, that God is indeed in control of all things. Now in verse 22, Daniel comes to the point, to point number two. It was the personal application to Belshazzar. It is a personal and a direct indictment on the king that should have, should have made him shiver even more if that was possible. But you, his son Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, though you knew all this. In other words, Belshazzar, what does it take to teach you? You knew all this. This is part of your history. It's the most stinging rebuke. And while we might ask ourselves... And the people of our, our generation, what does it take to teach us? We too know so much. We, too, we know much about the Bible. And the lessons of history are there for us to read. Will Jesus say to many on the last day, you knew all this, but you have never acted on it. You grew up in a church. You heard the gospel and you did nothing with it. You knew all this. Belshazzar, you knew all this about all the pride of Nebuchadnezzar and the way God humbled him, and yet you set yourself against the God of heaven by desecrating these holy vessels of God's temple. In doing so, you praised the idol gods and it provoked the only true God. And then Daniel saved the most devastating blow till last. But the God in whose hand is your breath and whose are all your ways you have not honored. That's your problem, Belshazzar. Belshazzar's greatest sin is that he did not honor and glorify God. Is that considered such a great sin today? I don't think so. 
For that, Belshazzar was accountable. Daniel held that before the king by interpreting the mysterious writing, mena, mena, tekel, parson. God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. You have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. And that fateful prediction would then come to swift fulfillment. That very night, Belshazzar was killed and Darius the Mede took over his kingdom. Amazing. Oh, what a needed message for people of also our times. It seems that more and more our culture lives as though people may do whatever they want to do. They've forgotten God. And God has no control, no authority over their lives. God really has no control over anything. That's the thinking, that's the mental thinking of so many in our day. And there are disturbing indications of that, aren't there, in our, our society today. The issue of sexuality is a case in point. Pornography and anything, any kind of sex outside of marriage is widely accepted as being perfectly okay, so is homosexuality, so is transgenderism, which you hear about every day. Laws are now being enacted. I want you to know this. Laws are now being enacted to protect and encourage that kind of immorality. We have to take note of that. For example, it is now the law in Canada that no one may prevent or discourage anyone, including your own children, from living out a gay lifestyle or changing his or her gender. If pastors preach against it or counselors or parents try to discourage it, they can face jail time for, for two to five years. Under present Canadian law, I could be put in prison for two to five years just for preaching this sermon. And I understand that there are states in the United States which now have similar laws or are working on them. These are stunning, stunning indications of the growing wickedness in our culture. And we have to take note of that. It's not going to get any easier to be Christian in our times. And what will it take to break the people of our nation to, a, to their knees? Will it take another pandemic, a worse pandemic? Will it take a third world war? Will it take a nuclear war? You see, God still knows how to shock his enemies to show them that he and he alone is the mighty God who is always in control. And people cannot, they, people cannot live in wickedness without any consequences. We have to understand as much as we love America, as much as we are devoted to America, God can bring America to an end just as easily and quickly as he did to the Chaldeans of old. This word of God from Daniel is, is a siren call to all of us that God holds our lives and all our ways in his hand. He is in control, make no mistake about it. His law he will enforce. Flaunting his word will meet with dreadful consequences. The revelation of his judgments are truly shocking, and they, they are certain if there's no change. But I don't want to end on that, that note. As true as all that is, there's something even more awesome, and that is his saving grace. 
his saving grace. And we must not lose sight of that truth. We too will be weighed on the scales, God's scales, and be found wanting. We have no righteousness in ourselves, but God has provided a righteousness for us. Instead of consigning a wicked race to eternal condemnation, God chose a virgin to conceive a baby boy, and he was called Jesus. He was fully human, but also the very Son of God. And he lived a perfect life. He was condemned to die. He was scorned by his enemies. He was tortured and nailed to a cross, a cross which bore the memo, the king of the Jews. And he died a death by which he suffered the punishment for all of our sins, the punishment that we deserved. And he has established his kingdom that has no boundaries and has no end. The kingdoms of Persia, the kingdoms of Babylon, the kingdoms of Rome, and every other human kingdom lay in the ashes of history. And so every human kingdom today. But Christ's kingdom has no end, has no boundaries. Jesus is the Savior from sin. He is the destroyer of the devil. He is destroyer of death itself by his own glorious resurrection. Then he has proven that He indeed has all things under his control. And if we believe in him, we will have life. A life of joy, a life of fulfillment and purpose. And we will be be given a life in in this beautiful, glorious new creation. All that Jesus is and came to do really is really the most shocking reality in all history because we had no claim on it. We could not expect it, but God, in his surprising grace, came to save his people. The Apostle Paul wrote in in Titus, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of, our, of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. That great day we look for. We look for when we, are, we, do, not, we do not dread it. We do not wait for it with fear, but with joyous anticipation. And to know that he is in control will be our everlasting joy. And even, though, and even now, we know that he's with us. He's our friend. He loves us. He comes near to us. He cares for us. And he's working in his mysterious ways of working all things together for our good. That's the wonder of God's grace. And now, still time to humble ourselves before him, confessing our sins, believing in his promise to forgive, and then to willingly live under his control. You're you're going to do that, dear friend. May God so help us. Amen. Heavenly Father, you are an amazing God. You give us, gave us an amazing word. And help us, O oh God, to take your word ever so seriously. You are the one with whom we have it to do and to whom we are always accountable. We pray that your amazing gospel may still give us a sense of awe and wonder that amazing love that you have for Jesus Christ is indeed awesome. Help us to enjoy that assurance today. In Jesus we pray, amen. Mighty fortress is our God. The four stanzas.
Heavenly Father, out of joy and thanksgiving, we come to you with this, with our song, and also, oh God, in a very tangible way, in the giving of these gifts. We love your kingdom, we love your, your word, and we want that to flourish also uh, in the ministry to our children in our Christian schools and in our, our youth organizations. Bless them to that end, we pray in Jesus, amen. Receive the blessing of the Lord, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all and all God's people said.